Hello, kiddos. I'm here with First Chapter Friday once again. Um, today, I'm going to be reading from Wolf by Wolf by Ryan Grodden. Um, it's another war story because it seems like we have um, a lot of students who enjoy them. Um, this is like an imagined history. It's about a girl uh, who is trying to kill Hitler. But I believe, I have not read it yet, but I believe it's like, what if Hitler had won the war and has taken over everywhere? And then now there's a group trying to stop them. Um, but yes, I keep getting requests for war stories, you little bloodthirsty children, and I want to keep my audience happy. So here we go. The rotten bones are trembling of the world before the Red War, and that's from the official song of the Hitler Youth. Once upon a different time, there was a girl who lived in a kingdom of death. Wolves howled up her arm, a whole pack of them, made of tattoo ink and pain, memory, and loss. It was the only thing about her that ever stayed the same. Her story begins on a train. Chapter one, then. The numbers, autumn 1944. There were 5,000 souls stuffed into the train cars, thick and deep like cattle. The train groaned and bent under their weight, weary from all of its many trips. 5,000 times 5,000, again and again. So many, so many. No room to sit, no air to breathe, no food to eat. Yale leaned on her mother and strangers alike until her knees ached. And long, long after, she choked in the smell of waste and took gulps from the needle-cold buckets of water that were shoved through the door by screaming guards. Far below the tracks, a slow, shuddering groan whispered her name over and over. Yael, Yael, Yael. You won't have to stand much longer. We're almost there, Yael's mother kept saying as she smoothed her daughter's hair. But almost there kept stretching on and on. One day rolled into two, into three. Endless hours of swaying kilometers and slats of sunlight that cut like knives through the car's shoddy planks and across the passengers' gray faces. Yael huddled against her mother's taffeta silk skirt and tried not to listen to the crying. Sobbed so loud her name almost drowned in them. But no matter how loud the sadness got, she could still hear the whisper. Yael, Yael, Yael. Constant, steady, always. A secret under everything. Three days of this. Yael, 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 squeal. Stop, nothing. And then the doors opened. Get out, hurry. A man, bald, thin, dressed in clothes like pajamas, yelled and kept yelling, even after they started spilling out of the train car. He yelled and yelled in a way that made Yael shrink against her mother. Hurry, hurry! All around was darkness and glare, night and spotlights. The cold air was sharpened by the screams of guards, snarling dogs, and snapping whips. Men on one side, women on the other. Push, push, jostle, push, screams. There was a sea of wool and shuffling. Everyone seemed lost, moving and pushing and crying and not knowing. Yael's fingers clenched at the edge of her mother's coat, so tight they could have been the seams of their own. Hurry, hurry, move! An iron voice inside Yael fought and pushed and cried, Do not get washed away. They were all flowing in one direction, away from whiplash and dog fangs, toward a man who stood on an overturned apple crate, looking out across the platform's dark, milling crowd. A floodlight bathed him. The pure white fabric of his lab coat glowed, and his arms were stretched wide like wings. He looked like an angel. Every face that passed he measured and judged, male and female, old and young, the man in the glowing lab coat plucked and sifted and pointed them into lines. Too small, too ill, too weak, too short, too old, he barked out characteristics like ingredients from twisted recipe, sweeping away their offenders with a wave of his hand. 
Those he approved of received a passing nod. When he saw Yael, he neither barked nor nodded. He squinted at first, eyes serpent sharp behind his glasses. Yael squinted back. There was a sharpness in her eyes, too. Wetted by three days of fear and two bright eyes, two bright lights. Her knees ached and wobbled, but she tried her best to stand straight. She did not want to be too small, too weak, too short. The man stepped down from the crate and walked toward Yale's mother, who shifted just so against her daughter as if to shield her. But there was no defense from this man's gaze. He saw all, staring at Yale and her mother as if they were suits that needed tailoring, taking measurements with his eyes, imagining what a few stitches and tucks might do. Yale stared back, taking measurements of her own. The man looked different up close, out of the light, with the shadows pressed in. They seemed extra dark on him, as if making up for that first glowing impression. He smelled different, too. Clean, but not. Harsh. Peeling scents, Yale later learned to associate with bleach and blood and uncareful scalpels. This man did not trade in heralds or blessings or miracles. He was an angel of a different kind. Yale's knees ached, ached, ached. Her eyes stung and watered. She kept standing, kept staring, clenching her mother's skirt with stubborn fingers. The man in the white coat glanced at the guard next to him, who was busy inscribing notes into a clipboard. Reserve this girl for Experiment 85. It's long term, so she should be housed in the inmate bird. Make certain her hair is only cut, not shorn. I need strands for samples. Yes, Dr. Greyer, the guard grabbed Yale's hand, snapped his pen across her skin in two quick strikes. X marks the survivor. What about the mother? The man shrugged. She seems strong enough, was all he said before he walked back to the crate, back to the light that made him dazzle and glow. Yale never did find out why Dr. Greyer chose her. Why she, out of all the young children who stumbled out of the train cars and clung to their mother's coats that night, was placed in line, in the line of the living. But it did not take her long to discover what she'd been marked for. This was Experiment 85. Every other morning, at the end of the four-hour roll call, a guard shouted out Yale's number. Every other morning, she had to follow him through two sets of barbed wire gates and over at the train tracks all the way to the doctor's office. The nurse always strapped Yale down to the gurney before the injections. She never really looked at Yale. Yale. Even when she turned the girl's arm over to check the number stamped there, those water-weak eyes always focused on the inanimate. Things like the not-quite-dry blood stains on the floor tiles or flecked across the pristine white of her apron, the shiny black leather of her shoes. The clipboard she scrawled Yale's information on. Inmate 121358 Delta Chi. Age six years. Experiment number 85. Melanin manipulation. Session 38. Dr. Geyer was different. From the moment he stepped across the threshold, his eyes never left Yale. He sat on his rolling stool, arms folded over his chest, leaned slightly back, examining the little girl in front of him. There were no wrinkles on his face, no wary frown or weight of the world sagging his skin. He even smiled when he asked his questions. Yael could see all of his white, white teeth cut apart by the tiny black gap where his two front incisors didn't quite meet. It was this part of his face she always focused on when he spoke. The gap the not-quite-fullness of his soft words, the single break in his paternal mirage. How are you feeling? He'd ask her, leaning forward on his toadstool seat. Yael never really knew the answer to this question. What exactly it was Dr. Geyer was expected her to say when the bunk she shared with her mother and Miriam and the three other women was infested with lice, when the night temperatures dropped so low that the straw in their mattress stabbed her skin like knitting needles, when she was hungry, always hungry, even though the babushka in the bunk across from her snuck her extra bread rations every night. Don't look at the knives. Tell him what he wants to hear. She wanted to be strong, brave, so she offered the one word a strong, brave girl might say. Fine. 
The doctor's smile always grew wider when she said this. Yael wanted to keep him happy. She didn't want the bloodstains on the floor just to be hers. Every session, he examined her skin, shone a dazzling pin light into her eyes, tugged out a few of her stubby hairs for color analysis. And when the string of questions and answers ended, Dr. Geyer took the clipboard from the nurse stationed in the corner. Always he flipped through the pages, his brown hair tumbling to his eyes as he deciphered the nurse's crude writing. Melanin production seems to be on a steady decline. No paler patches on skin as well as slight change in subject's iris pigmentation. Ooh, Lord. Eumelanin is also decreasing, as can be seen by the subject's hair coloration. They never called Yale by her name. She was always subject. Or if they needed to be more specific, inmate 121385 Delta Chi. We're making progress, Dr. Geyer's smile stretched as if his lips were being held open by tender hooks. He handed the clipboard back to the nurse, rolled his seat to the sterling tray table where the needle sat in a neat row. Straight silver fangs waiting to sink poison into Yale's skin, fill her with another two days of fire and agony. Change her from within. Take all the colors and feelings and human inside. Drain, drain, drain until nothing was left. Just a ghost of a girl, a nothing shell. Progress. All right, so that's the end of chapter one. Sorry that I struggled with the names. Um, I tried. We do have two copies of this in the library. It was a Lone Star book a couple years ago. The kiddos who read it loved it. Um, as always, I'm sure you can find copies at your local library or you can buy your own. It's actually on sale for about $8 um, for the Kindle edition on Amazon right now. Not to plug for them, but just saying. Uh, so there's lots of ways you can get your hands on this book. And I will talk to you next time.